speaking your soul but using your mind, the impact of social media on pro-life. Um, and I should turn this off because we're here. Uh, one of the things I really wasn't expecting to become as an LCMS pastor was something of a, uh, a pretend or a hack guru on social media and or new media. Uh, this revolutionary shift in technology that you could say began with the television. You could say it began uh, with the computer, um, but really has come into its own in the last 12 years with the internet. Um, I still remember being a, a, a senior in high school, logging into America Online with that, you know, kind of thing. And all you could do was just talk to each other in these chat rooms, and uh, it took forever to download anything. And now, uh, that the very computer I was using to do that is a dinosaur compared to this little thing I'm holding in my hand, um, which this is totally an experiment just to show off uh, how fun things are being. Um, with my phone here and my iPad there, I can actually make my PowerPoint presentation just move around. That's, that's how far we've come in such a short time. Uh, we'll try to actually talk about these slides at some point. But this, this is like a, a, a whirlwind uh, tidal wave storm of change. Change in the way that people communicate, change in the way that people think, uh, that they dialogue, that they meet, that they network. You have whole communities that exist in our world where the people have never met each other face to face. Or maybe they do, but only once a year at a special gathering, yet they're able to hang out and uh, uh, talk online. Um, as a, a, a former World of Warcraft video game player, uh, the people who I knew in that video game who I have never met face to face were real people with real lives and real problems. And at times we even have discussions about religion, uh, not too often, but we talk about all sorts of stuff. This is just a, a sea change and we cannot overestimate it. Um, the uh, uh, two books, if you, if you want to learn about these things, uh, Neil Postman, spelled just like Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death, written in 1982 or 84, talks about the way that television has changed the way that social debate has taken place in our life. And we see this in the pro-life movement especially, where you don't have debates, where people get up and talk for an hour and a half about the value of a pro-life position, and then the respondent's given an hour to, to respond to this, kind of like the, the Douglas and uh, Lincoln debates were. Instead, you have sound bites geared for emotional impact to propagate an idea without you ever having to even think about it. Yeah? That's what television has done to, to social debate. The internet then has shifted this even more. The, the book to read about the internet first, if you're going to read anything, is Clay Shirky, S-H-I-R-K-Y. Uh, here comes everybody. Uh, now, I'm not going to talk a lot about these things today, but this is just, you can't think about how to change minds in the uh, the social sphere without engaging the social media new technology in some way. Recognizing its profound power to wiggle its way into uh, corners that you never thought it would get into. I had a student at the Fort Wayne Seminary come up to me this week, I was there for symposia, uh, telling me that worldview everlasting is big in Indonesia. So I'm sorry. What are you talking about? I'm some guy, you know, in his office talking to a webcam, and there's Lutheran pastors in Indonesia watching this because it's giving them words they need to speak to their people. Um, you can't plan this. You, you can't control it, and that's the weakness. The other thing about social media is institutions and groups of people tend to overestimate its power to be manipulated. Um, and that's kind of what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on with these slides here. Um, so you've got this... this storm of things happening where people are being connected. Uh, the global public square is right uh, in your living room on your Facebook page. It's the water cooler for the world. You got people sharing stuff about themselves you just wish they would never even talk about, right? So you got to close them off. I'm not going to, I'm going to silence their thread. Don't want to unfriend them. That might offend them, but I'll silence them so I don't have to see their stuff anymore, right? Um, and yet you have uh, massive amounts of news coming through. Uh, this is great for ostracized groups who want to propagate their ideas, whether they're true or not. But I, I was just, today in my thread for uh, Facebook, there was a thing about the, the FEMA concentration camps that the government is building and how conspiracy theorists, this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, I don't know if it's true. I just don't want to know about it. I'm kind of in that that kind of a place, but it's just amazing the information that's being cast about left and right, the global public square. Um, and it's unorganized. This networking is happening without intentional manipulation. Now, Facebook does use a logarithm uh, that 
or a series of them that uh, kind of weeds out based on what you do look at some friends. So if you look at one friend every day, your their stuff's going to show up in your feed more than if you look at someone else's friend uh, uh, page. Um, uh, but overall, it's largely unorganized. It, it is just the power of the information moving itself uh, back and forth. And this isn't always a good thing, right? This is a, an example of a, a, an online YouTube discussion that I, I pirated from another guy giving a talk about this stuff. But it really just show you how this is not always good for information. You know, here's, here's a, a discussion between Mr. M Mr. Mr. Get Real 100 and Jimmy Distant. Uh, hey, you child molester, why support your white evangelical Christians who are into child abuse? That makes you a pervert and a corrupt cop, says Mr. Mr. Get Real. And his response, in good civility and debate, uh, uh, show me, you little maggot something, where I ever stated that I condone abuse of children, you're a lying sack, but I expect that of you as a representative of the cesspool you call decent people, capitalized decent, uh, deplore your kind and everything you stand for because anyone who had dealings with cockroaches knows they can't be trusted. Da, 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 da. Right. Well, not a lot of real actual communication going on there, huh? Yeah? Um, <laughs> Uh, there's a limitation to these tools, and part of it is limited by the ability of individuals to converse, the, le the level of education which in our country is dropping. Part of it is that we've actually been able to demonstrate now that uh, a comment thread and even email, uh, by its virtue as a medium, increases conflict. You, because the lack of social expression that goes into the plain words in an email and the ability with which you can rattle it off, you don't have to sit down and think about it and write it out, uh, creates less clear communication that people tend to assume the negative of. And so you can write off something about how you were bothered by something somebody said, and you mean it in all love and, and uh, fellowship, and they think it's hate mail. Yeah? And so they respond in kind, and it just escalates. Uh, so these tools create problems for communication as well. Um, and you, know, you maybe have even been in a, in a conversation, maybe not quite like this, uh, but, but one that it escalates and then someone comes in and you, you don't even know what they're talking about. You know, they're so angry. Uh, all of this flying back and forth and then us with the question that uh, on several levels as Christians, how does this affect mission, right? Uh, how does it affect the proclamation of the gospel and the law? Uh, and then as, as pro-life Christians, uh, how can we change minds about abortion? Um, about, uh, as uh, Dr. Scare said, uh, this contraceptive society, right? And he wasn't just talking about the pill, per se. He's talking about this mindset against conceiving that dominates our society. And I, I have felt that, especially as a young person growing up in it, as opposed to what we might call a procreative society, right? Not that you have to have as many kids as possible, but that we are pro-kids, yeah? That we encourage the having of kids. Yeah? Uh, how do you begin to even talk about these ideas when the moment you put one of those ideas out, there's a whole string of uh, comments calling you a maggot, yeah? Um, and then recognize at the same time that when you do put stuff out, it has the capability of going far beyond a conversation you have with your neighbor on your porch. And then there's the fact that we're not having conversations with our neighbors on our porch anymore. It's just a profound time to be alive, really. We're right on the cusp of it. Nothing like this has happened since the printing press. And this is maybe bigger. Um, anyway, that's, that's all that uh, Clay Shirky stuff. So, all right, so tip number one, how can you take advantage of this new media in order to more effectively make people think like you? Tip number one, you can't. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't do that. Uh, what you have to do is Learn to be the person that you are faithfully and conscientiously, and then trust that the new media is going to do what it does. It's going to take that and shove it out. And uh, the, yes, um, if you are a Monty Python fan, you will get this. The duck will float. <laughs> yeah? Um, if you're not a Monty Python fan, you have no idea what I just said. Yeah? But this is, again, the power of social media. Right? Everyone who's a Monty Python fan now likes me a little bit more than before I did that. Yeah? For no good reason. Right? Just because we have this thing in common through the media. Well, the duck will float. There's this hilarious scene where this, this town in the Middle Ages is calling a, uh, a woman a witch, and uh, they're trying to figure it out. And so this, this genius guy in the black helmet uh, says that if she, you know, what, what floats um, wood, and witches are made of wood, and so if she floats, 
um, or weighs the same as something which floats, then she's a witch, and so uh, they, well, what floats? Rocks? No. Ducks float. Okay, so they put her in this giant pendulum thing to see if she weighs the same as a duck, and lo and behold, she does, and so she's a witch, and they take her off to stone her. Um, makes no sense, but it's hilarious. <laughs> um, uh, and as an illustration about the, the value of information on the internet, that which is valuable will rise to the surface, and what happens is people see it, they take part in it, they like it, whatever, even like something as silly as this, and they click share, and they push it. And that gets done exponentially, and so good stuff just flies. Nobody shares that comment about the maggot, yeah? And so th that's the power of this stuff, is that uh, you can't manipulate it to get people to think like you think. But if what you think and say is true, if it's valuable, people will pay attention to it and push it forward. And so we can have informational impact far beyond even what the printing press did and still does through this amazing medium, but not by trying to manipulate it. And that's one of the key things to learn about it. All right, so the rest of the time now this morning, I want to um, use social media, new media, this technology, this crazy little Apple integrated thing, um, to show you things I've found in new media on the internet, pictures and images that I think can help put the entire question of the abortion debate in perspective. And I, I, I mean seriously in perspective. The, uh, I think it was Dr. Benny this morning was talking about um, this conversation he had with an individual who thinks that the, the, the pro-life abortion debate does not matter. And his whole reasoning was that the, the embryo, the, the fetus, is so small. What, when do we start equating small with value? And what makes him think that he's so big? Yeah. Now, but before I go and chase that idea, I think it's a really cool idea, we're going to look at it. Um, first I want to say, my goal now also, if you can take yourself out of the presentation, my goal is also to show you how powerful these images and media are at manipulating your emotions. Yeah. If there's anything video is good for, it is good for propaganda for getting you to feel a certain way even without your brain. If there's anything I hope I do with Worldview Everlasting is that I do that, and yet in doing that, teach you to think so you start questioning even the stuff I'm saying. Uh, and uh, realizing that just because you're watching something doesn't make it true and so forth. Hopefully you're going to see that. You can take yourself out of it and see how these images are going to build upon each other to get past your brain and into your heart. And this is a, another thing we need to learn about social media, um, what it's good for, what it's not. All right. That's the caveat. So, that's the perspective. How big is the Earth? Anybody know? 25,000 miles. 25, miles around. Sounds good. I'm not even sure. I'm going to read it off the, the wiki page I found information on. Um, comparing it to the mass of a human being. An average North American adult has a mass near 100 kilograms, a little less than that. People like to pretend all North Americans are fat. Um, the mass of the Earth is almost 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. That would, therefore, it would take this many, 6, I don't even know that number, that many average North Americans that have the same mass as the Earth. That's a, a, you know, not weight, but a mass issue. There's only 6, uh, 6, 6,600,000,000 humans on Earth, and they're not all as fat as North Americans. So, <laughs> I, I just pulled this off the internet. That's not me. You know, I'm not a prejudice. Um, the, so the mass of all human beings put together represent a little less than point that many zeros, one percent of the Earth's mass. It's pretty big, right? The Earth is approximately that number. <laughs> Let's try to say that. That number meters cubed in size. Humans cannot, uh, cannot be centerized very well, but let's take the average male in America who weighs 190 pounds. Same idea, and he's showing these big numbers again, right? To put this in context, the sun is only one million times the size of the Earth, whereas the Earth is 1.26 sextillion times larger than a human. In other words, the Earth is one quadrillion times larger than a human than the Sun is larger than the Earth. Huh? Right? It, th that is so big, this Earth that we live on, this planet, this ground, I'm not even on the ground now, I'd jump if I was. This, this ground is so big, we can't even conceive of it with our heads. Yeah? Um, how can we begin to say that, that something that is this small compared to me is small when I am that much smaller than the planet I live on 
multiplied to whatever exponent. But to try to put this in perspective, to try to give you a visual experience of just how insignificant you are, and even then that, that baby is, that is the first skyscraper. The Equitable Life Assurance Building, New York City, 1873, a whopping 130 feet. First to feature a passenger elevator. Now, if you look carefully, uh, there is a person, it's really tough to see, there is a person standing in that picture. You can kind of figure, though, there's, there's about seven stories there in terms of the breaks, but they're not real stories because that would be a 70-foot tall building. So those stories, those, those breaks in the building are about 18 feet each. So like a human is a third of one of those breaks in the building. So you can kind of compare yourself to that, right? Now, 1974, Sears Tower. When I was a kid, this was the tallest building on the planet. 1,729 feet. How does that compare to the Equitable Life Building? You can see the two arrows pointing down uh, is the Equitable Life Building and the Sears Tower. That monstrosity on the far side with the giant red arrow pointed at it, that is the Burj Khalifa, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, in Dubai, United Arab, Arab Emirates, the current largest building in the world, 2009 is when it was built, 2,717 feet and a cost of $1.5 billion to build. Look at that compared to the Sears Tower. How many here has been to the Sears Tower? Some of you? Yeah, so you know how big that thing is, right? This thing is almost twice its size. And you got to cheat with the Sears Tower with those silly little spikes on top, right? Um, biggest building on the planet. Okay, well, how do buildings compare to, say, mountains? You can see there Mount Fuji, 12,338 feet, uh, 3,776 meters. And it's in the background of, uh, of uh, a Japanese city. I should know this off the top of my head, but I've forgotten. I didn't write, write it down. Um, that's a little deceptive picture, though, because you're, you're seeing it in the distance. So you're not really getting a comparison of the size. So I put together a little chart. There you go. There's our first chart with our buildings, our tallest building in the world, and there's Mount Fuji next to it. Holy mackerel, mountains are big. Yeah? Where'd the human go in this picture? Disappeared pretty fast. You're way down there. You can kind of see the blip, the dot that, that would be uh, the first skyscraper, that Equitable Life building. Think about Mount Fuji. It's not that big. Mountains of the world. It doesn't even make the, all that red is the highest mountains in Asia. It doesn't even make the chart. I had to put it in there because the highest mountains in Asia go off the top and continue to beat the highest mountains everywhere else. The green is uh, South America's highest mountains. Look at all those mountains in Asia that are bigger. Uh, North America is the blue, dark blue. McKinley's sitting there doing us proud. Um, all the way down to Australia, you know, doesn't really deserve to be on the map. Um, nothing personal. Um, but so you got Fuji there right next to that tallest mountain in the world, which you probably know the name of, Mount Everest, in, uh, in the Himalayas, which is a range of mountains nearly as big as Mount Everest. There you can see a, uh, a topical uh, physical map of uh, the Himalayas in Nepal. That's only part of it. You can see the location of Mount Everest. Himalayas are, in fact, so big you can see them from space, which is kind of cool. Um, now, of course, this is slightly zoomed in. This is not from distance in space, but you can see that, that white snow train running off into the horizon there is this range of giant mountains. Yeah. You need to scoot back a little bit. You can even still see it. I wish I had a pointer for you. You can see it there uh, between India and Nepal to the north. Uh, you can kind of see where the, the Himalayas are as a, as a line on the map. You can't really see Mount Everest, though, can you? Uh, it's, it's not there. A little further into space, and there's our planet that's so big we can't comprehend it. Huh? Oh, but then again, you know what? Earth's really pretty small. Pretty insignificant, even. You guys remember the Voyager? I was just a kid when Voyager got sent out. Uh, it was this big deal. Uh, on July 6th, and I didn't write down the, de the year. How silly is that? July 6th, I think it's now going on seven years ago or so. Voyager passed out of our solar system. And right before it did, it turned around and it took a series of pictures aimed back at the sun and the earth. And this is one of those pictures. It doesn't look like much, right? You got three streaks of light. And if you look really, really carefully at the top streak of light, about two thirds of the way that way, there is the smallest of palest blue dots. 
sitting right in that light, almost as if God was like setting up the shot. Of course, nobody thought that. There's no purpose to this. There's no meaning in this at all. This is just the random chance of evolution. We all know that. <laughs> Silly Christians. But nonetheless, uh, that, that image struck a chord with science. And scientists, Carl Sagan wrote the book Pale Blue Dot about it and, and used this image as his proof that uh, Earth is tremendously insignificant in the universe. You can't even really see it. He didn't even say in the universe. He said in the, the solar system, in the galaxy. Speaking of galaxies. Oh, that, that's a shot of, to the side, this is a shot of where uh, Voyager was when it took the picture, that little map there. Um, this is a more fun, um, a hyper eye shot of where that shot is in space in relation to the sun itself. So there were a couple of high def shots that were taken, which is where you can see the pale blue dot. This is further back with a less resolution for up close of the sun itself. And those pictures there are placed in the location that got the high def, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, there's our solar system then, again. Voyager was on the outside. Now we're far enough back, you couldn't see the pale blue dot even if you wrote it down. And the dots there are not to scale. They're just there so you can know where the, the planets are. This is our solar interstellar neighborhood. Right at the center of it, you can see it says solar system in red with the sol or sun. So a solar interstellar neighborhood, this, each dot here represents a full solar system containing stars and planets, some of which we've observed. And it's done by general location, and it's scaled to reflect the size of the star, but this is not actually the scale that, that, that they would be. So they aren't this big when you look at them with the eye. They would be smaller than this. But it's reflecting kind of their distance and, and the size of the star as best we can. Solar interstellar neighborhood. Oh, man, it just keeps going, though. There is a line drawn to where our solar interstellar neighborhood lies in the Milky Way galaxy. We zoom in on the Milky Way galaxy. Gosh, we just got even smaller still. Our solar interstellar neighborhood is so small you can't even pick it out in our galaxy. We are on the Orion arm. I learned that, kind of a fun fact. Um, and there's a neat movie out there you can watch called um, Privileged Planet, which talks about this and how our, our solar system and our interstellar neighborhood and our planet are placed in a part of the Milky Way galaxy, which makes it possible for life, carbon-based life to develop, and how other places in this galaxy, you can't just fly there and hang out. Um, it would actually uh, destroy us. It's a fascinating movie, uh, uh, Privileged Planet. But hey, look. OK, so there are the red language. That's the Milky Way galaxy in our local galactic group. Every single one of those things there is another galaxy. Now, ours is pretty big compared to uh, some of them, although the Andromeda galaxy is significantly larger than the Milky Way. And it just keeps going. Our local galactic group in the midst of the Virgo supercluster. So those are now clusters of galaxies backed out to make this supercluster, which, yeah, golly, it could just be a constellation of the star in the sky made out of 15 stars, right? But those are all, uh, uh, super, or are all galaxies. And the, uh, the Virgo supercluster uh, is in the midst of a local area of superclusters. So each one of those little wavy thing there, that, each of those is a supercluster of galaxies. Yeah? Um, and you can go back further. And uh, this is kind of a shot of our local supercluster. You can almost see it with the, the, the line from the local superclusters in red aiming down there in the midst of a whole lot more superclusters, which then exists right about there in the observable universe. Our universe is, is pretty incredible in this way. It's got a lot of amazing things. I used to love looking at books uh, of these kind of constellations and nebula as a kid. Uh, you even, God even made this, this beautiful thing here. So I believe it's an interstellar tribute uh, to Marty McFly. Um, God, God foresaw you know, great 80s movies. Um, at the same time, and in all seriousness, uh, how small then is this pale blue dot? And how insignificant are we in this massive, massive reality? The mountains are small. Our buildings are just puny. So what are you? And then for our purposes today, really, what's a baby? A baby who, when the baby is born, 
was about the size of a pumpkin. Actually, that's 10 weeks prior to the birth of the child. Small, especially compared to the pale blue dot. It's not super small, but it goes further back, and we all know this. It's kind of fun. Keep going the other direction. At 10 weeks, uh, well, this is 10 weeks prior, it's a cabbage. Uh, you can see a cabbage compared to a quarter there. That quarter is going to remain at least for one more, more shot, maybe. No, it's not. Because I got fed up. As I was doing this, you know, this whole series, you can find this, of, of fruits and vegetables compared to the size of a baby. And I just had to ask the question, um, you know, there's, there's a grape uh, going further back, but I started asking the question, what on earth is the deal with children and flowers and fruits and vegetables? How am I, as a man, supposed to resonate with this? In fact, I'm offended. Yeah? No one took me into account. And so I went looking and I found a man's guide to the size of a baby. <laughs> At week 10 of development, a human baby is about the size of the head of that hammer. Good. I can resonate with that. Yeah. All right. Um, and uh, three weeks prior to that, the baby was the size of the power button on the TV remote. Yeah. Three weeks, uh, two weeks before that, the size of a BB. Yeah. At four weeks, we're back to the fruit and vegetables. The baby is the size of a poppy seed. And before that, the baby is virtually invisible to the human eye, smaller than the pale blue dot was to Voyager. Yeah. And now again, and I've got to thank Dr. Benny for setting this up so well, you've got a, a man saying it's not a big issue because the baby's so small. What's small? And if, if we must judge our identity based on our size as creatures, which of us can be kept alive and be counted worth something? Of course, we live in an age where human life is all across the board discounted. And yet, December 14, 2012, in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, one man fatally shot 20 children and six adult staff, and the nation was outraged at this. How could this possibly happen? What's the value of 20 people on this pale blue dot? Why are we so angry? Why are we so angry? What's the value of a person? For argument's sake, let's say, let's give a penny to each of those kids that was shot. 20 plus pennies. 9-11, the U.S. lost 30 bucks. Hiroshima, about 800 bucks in nuclear devastation. Auschwitz, $10,000 in Jews, Poles, Russians, and others murdered by Hitler. $13,000 in soldiers who've died in every war the United States has ever fought. When you come to the United States abortions, that's $500,000 in pennies. Since 1973, thanks to Roe versus Wade, again, it's too big to picture. Executions since 1973, 1,235. And yet the argument for uh, uh, the death penalty resonates so strongly. Military deaths make the death penalty pale in comparison since 1973, 46,526. Of course, that's really a pretty small number compared to the motor vehicle deaths. 1,657,811. 1, uh, I think we should outlaw cars because they're killing people. Yeah. And yet you put those... Pictures there, and you add abortions. And they just don't even exist, these other numbers. Insignificant digits. I have here, it's one-fourth of everyone conceived after 1973. I've heard it said here, and I've said it other places, one-third. I don't know what the number actually is at this point. I don't care. It's an insane number. I can't fathom it any more than I can fathom the size of the planet that I live on. But would it bother us more if they use guns to do it? That picture's from a site called abort73.com. Got some cool images trying to use social media again to impact people. You might check that out if you're interested in that. But the answer is a clear, yes, it would. 23 pennies throw a nation into outrage over the tragedy and horror on this pale blue dot. We can't believe we live in such a world, and yet 54 million babies aborted since 1973, and we don't even think twice about it because we're not using guns to do it, apparently. Hopefully what I did was just manipulated your emotions yeah, and made you feel 
like abortion is really wrong. It made you feel like we live in a really strange universe that's huge. I'm going to tell you God's in control of all of it. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is proof of this. And he's given us an age in which, by one-to-one connections, networked via social media, we do have the ability to impact emotions and minds by being honest people of integrity who clearly present the case for where we live and why. Now, as people of faith, we confess this is a world created by God. There's strength in that. As people of reason, we can also talk about how, if we're going to judge things by the significance of size, then all of us on this pale blue dot mean nothing. And no one's going to admit that. Oh, no, we all mean something. Well, then we need to think of the least in our midst. You can get there with reason as well. And what society can survive by killing its children? We hate cannibals. Well, why don't we hate those who murder children? Why don't we hate ourselves for this? There's a countless ways you could go at it. It doesn't matter. The whole thing about social media is you do it with your mind and your heart and your passion. Get the right information. Don't tell lies. But then trust that the ducks are going to float. Yeah? The ideas are going to have value. It may not overturn Roe versus Wade in my lifetime. And, and frankly, to me, that's not my goal. My goal is to change one mind here and there and save a baby here and there. Yeah? Um, my goal is to speak about Jesus Christ and bring to faith people here and there. Yeah? Evangelicals are always trying to convert the whole world. They're, they're impatient. They don't have time. They're, they're trying to save everybody. And sadly, if you look at their numbers, they end up bringing a lot of people in and a lot of them go right back out. The strength of the church, as Herman Sasa wrote, is that she, knowing she has a future in Jesus, doesn't have to rush. We can worry about the truth, speak it, and know it's going to make action happen. The word, driven by the Spirit of God, will do what God sends it to do. That's both law and gospel. We're talking pro-choice, pro-life. We're talking law. And we have every duty to speak that clearly and with passion. We're talking Jesus and resurrection, faith in the church. We're talking gospel. And if you believe that, you can't help but start to talk about it, yeah? There is a lot of hope for this pale blue dot. It starts with our God and trust that he is in charge of this whole thing. It's by knowing that and confessing that that we will see, whether we ever overturn anything, we will see lives saved, we will we'll see the church grow, we will see the church saved on the coming of our Lord Jesus, that day we all look forward to. I hope I've caused you to put a little of that in perspective, one way or the other, and thank you for your time. I liked uh, you playing with all these numbers, and there was a number that came into my mind that I don't know, and I would like to know if anybody does know. Okay. We know how many abortions were registered after Roe v. Wade, how many happened uh, during the time before, the 3,000 years or whatever before that. Yeah, I don't know. Does anybody here know that? Number of abortions that we know of before Roe v. Wade? My guess is it's less than were actually taking place because it was illegal. Yeah? Humans have this tremendous need to kill our children. If you look back at the history of the human race, civilizations have been justifying this to themselves forever. Why were the Philistines and the, and the others of, of uh, the Canaanites driven out of the land by God? Because they were murdering their babies, putting them into Moloch's burning molten hands. Yeah? Um, so this isn't a new thing. Uh, if we're going to try to keep track of the number of infants that have been slaughtered by their parents in history, it's a, it's a mind-boggling number. It shows you the great evil that original sin has wrought on us. How we will, uh, for, for spite or for joy, I don't know, we will do horrendous things. It tells you the great love which the Father has lavished on us. That seeing this planet that deserves to be burned, he sent his son into the fire to pull you out. Huh? Crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, just a couple comments. Um, uh, I heard some time ago that, uh, you know, the studies will say that actually Facebook and social media actually continue to um, restrict who we uh, are, uh, who we, who we uh, are friends with um, uh, that are opposite our mm -hmm. positions and things like that. So we're, we're just further isolating ourselves, which does not help our cause, you yeah. know. And the other thing that 
um, really disturbs me, and I, I just can't get uh, over it because I'm always, I'm always calling people on it. These well-meaning Christians who, 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 who you know, circulate all these um, uh, stupid, um, slanderous, half-truth kind of um, blurbs that go out, uh, you know, circular around, and which, which are just really they're unthinking. They mm -hmm. are slanderous. They, they just give a bad impression. I think about what Christians are all about. So I just want to encourage everybody just to be careful just write your own your own thoughts instead of just repeating some some blog everything you uh, see for, for, for some somebody else the, the Facebook thing about it it regulating what you see that's what I was saying about they have these logarithms built in so if you're always clicking on Fox News gradually that's all you're gonna see is Fox News um, and you know whether or not Fox News is true to be able to see the whole uh, forum Facebook doesn't quite let you do that the, the leadership of the visioneering technology world that does their TED Talks and all the stuff, you know what that stuff is? They're, they're saying to Facebook, this isn't helpful, whether Facebook will listen or not is one thing. But Facebook's one corner, it has a big market, but you got the whole blogosphere. There's a lot of Twitter, you got, there's a lot of different places. So it's not stopping all discussion, but it, does, it can have that impact of limiting what you see. Google has the same problem, actually, with its Google searches. Um, uh, the second thing he said, oh, yes, and I mentioned the water cooler of the world. That's just it. You say something on Facebook, and the world can see it. And just not even just your friends. If they share something that you said, it can just go off everywhere. Um, so for Christians, it does behoove us to learn. I mean, if you wouldn't say it at the water cooler, goodness gracious, don't put it on your Facebook page. Um, uh, you have no idea how this might impact other people. I think about pastors. Uh, the danger we have is when we're talking to our friends and we're complaining about the office and the day job and how it's tough, the people hate us, blah, 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 and someone at your church just read it, you know? Oh, crud, yeah? Um, it, it, is a, it is a real issue of uh, uh, social media etiquette, and it's one that is only barely being talked about outside the church, let alone in the church. So I think that's something that usually needs more discussion, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's, there's several things touching on what you said. One thing is like that online, it kind of allows you, it kind of emboldens people to, to say things they would never say face to face mm -hmm. with someone because there's, it's like, there's not that emotional connection you would normally have when you're talking to someone. Um, but that being said, there are all, also proper ways to do it. You can work through the system as long as you, mm -hmm. As long as you are logically coherent and not like using ad hominem attacks. Sure, constantly. the system's going to be what it is. We can't stop it, and you know the the knee jerk to withdraw because the system has such a tendency with all the sinful humans in it to have nasty little you maggot comments around it. Well, if we withdraw like the monastics would have us do, then there's no voice in the system for the good. Uh, as John Adams, great comment. If if only uh, or if good men refuse to go into politics, you will only have wicked men in politics, yeah? So there's a point at which you do have to not, I wouldn't say use the system, but engage the system for what it is, craft what you say with patience, recognizing that it is easily misunderstood as a medium, it heightens tensions. Um, and also see, I mean, the part about how it, it emboldens people, that has a, a bad side, that has a good side too. You got people that are afraid to make human relationships in real life who on the internet now can find friends that they don't, uh, their, their own social quirks uh, don't get in, in the way of. Uh, I still remember a movie I watched on video game play um, online where they're, uh, one of, they focused on a number of stories, but there was this uh, young um, man with a, a handicap of some kind, I don't know what, he was in a wheelchair, his face was disfigured, he could not talk, and yet in one of these 3D virtual chat things would go in and he had a small community of friends that he could talk to. Where otherwise, you know, he goes out and sits at a coffee shop and you know what's going to happen in our world. And just we're going to ignore him and walk right by him. Yeah, so there's, there's a positive side to this too. It's like all of God's creation, the first article. We are given good gifts. And then being sinners, we just ruin them and use them for evil. But it doesn't make the gifts not good. They're still good. As Christians now, we are redeemed, knowing that we don't need to use these gifts to prove to God that we're good. But that waiting for Christ, who has made us good to return... We get to use these good, good gifts for the good of our neighbor. And that's within the context of confession and absolution, within the context of word and sacrament. We're sinners. We're going to continue to make mistakes, but we don't want to throw aside those good things, especially as people of the word, when this good thing that's happening is a medium for the word. 
It is a way of communicating truth. Yeah? Um, like I said, we're at the start of this, this age. Uh, I don't profess to be an expert. I just am a student of it. I find it fascinating. Um, I think we're at a time. I hope that what I've shared has just caused you to think about it a little bit more. So, right. cool.